No, please, you just leave it there. Yeah. We have two talks. I hope you don't uh, mix the rooms. But yeah. the other room was the morning talk for an art. Uh, now we will have a here. We will have a, also talk about art. And we're super happy to have with us one of the main developers of uh, uh, back in old days, the SP package. Uh, which was the backbone of many other packages so with a lot of dependencies and uh, together with Roger Bivan uh, as a help name uh, this basic infrastructure for the spatial analysis their book uh, applied spatial data analysis got sold out three times for good reasons now you're working on a new book uh, spatial data science, science yes with R uh, you can follow the progress of the book online it's a very interesting experiment you can see all the changes and uh, discussions uh, so yeah we're super happy to have with us uh, and he will talk about sf sf time i didn't even know about sf time so it's great development and the stars package so looking forward right. to that one and a half hour keep some time for questions there's people online following uh valentino will make sure everything is going uh and yes thank you uh, thank you so much tom for the nice introduction yes um, and, and thanks also for everyone online following this. Um, I should look in that, into that camera, right? Hi there. Um, yeah, so I'm indeed a little bit uh, longer involved in this whole our spatial thing. Um, that uh, started in 2003 by a uh, workshop that uh, Roger Bivent then organized in the context of a USAR conference. Uh, which which was not called USAR in those days, um, and and where he collected all kind of people uh, doing things with with R and spatial, but also grass people and other sort of open source spatial people, and uh, and after that we dis we thought oh it might be a good idea to start something uh, with spatial data in R to kind of there were several packages that was the the the, the idea or the, the problem several packages doing all kind of things and they all made different assumptions about how your spatial data would come. And that made it somewhat difficult to go from one package to the other. Yeah, so we said, okay, maybe it's useful to have some kind of common classes, like we have data frames for tabular data. Uh, maybe we make something for spatial data, uh, like what do we have, points, lines, polygons, and grids. We did that. And then we, we did package SP. And package SP, actually, uh, so, so Roger already had a lot of things going on. And I was crazy enough to, uh, um, I was crazy enough to uh, pick up the sort of doing the the main the, the initial writing and the maintenance. So it really initial writing was by Roger, uh, me and, and Barry also and Virgilio contributed, um, and um, so we just uh, just uh, uh, talked to to Martijn. So we made all the we made all the beginner mistakes there really that we uh, that sort of looking back that we now think are uh, you know are. We now think our mistakes, but back in the days, were not, you know, maybe not so not so stupid mistakes. The thing is that um, we uh, 
the, the only thing you could, you know, you had in those days, 2003, 2004, when it is about vector data, was shapefiles. Yeah, the shapefile was the thing. So if you would, if somebody had polygon, somebody had vector data, then it would be shapefile data. There was no really other thing. So post EIS was just sort of coming up and experimental and so on, and probably still working, probably already working for for more adventurous people. But we looked at sort of what is what is happening, what is going on, and it was uh, shapefiles. And and shapefiles is just a you know doesn't have a spec, is not doesn't have a model. So you get a bunch of rings, and you never know whether something is an outer ring, whether something is a hole, or whatever which things belong together. And and so so some of that mess kind of. Uh, was drawn into into this uh, package SP, which is which has some kind of ambiguity about whether rings are holes or not, uh, and that is not you know that is not very uh, convenient. Um, we did then we did um, basically um, in um, 2015 2016 we started to, uh, to we started all over basically uh, from kind of from scratch. This was one of the um, one of one of the aspects was was kind of the, the shape files. Um, another aspect was the, the raster data. We, we did a very simple raster uh, implementation, but it was not very uh, scalable what we did. And uh, luckily, uh, Robert Heidmans of of raster and now Terra Fame um, uh, actually uh, came up in I think in 2010. With a package called uh, Raster, let me see when that started. Raster Archive, yeah. So that appeared for the first time in 2010 on uh, on the Cron. So Robert had a long history of writing GIS, basically software that that you know that all inclusive software things that you would start and run on your computer and could do everything and so on. And then he sort of made the same experience that we had, like okay, if you implement things in R, you not only have things running in R and, and sort of implement things relatively quickly because it's all scripted and there's a lot of things you can reuse, but you also have this all all other things like suddenly graphics works on all, on all possible computers and you don't have to work with that, don't have to worry that suddenly you can work with, with kind of data structures, suddenly you can do, a, you know, modeling and regression modeling and integrate that with your, with your spatial stuff, yeah, so this idea that that you not you know you don't have to have to do everything from from scratch, um, so that was uh, that was what what raster uh, then sort of filled a big gap uh, for the for the raster data archive. You can see that the SP started in two thousand five on uh, on uh, cron, but we had a lot of uh, prior versions on back in those days on SourceForge and uh, a lot of discussions on how to do things and uh, started doing things. And now you can see there's a lot of uh, things here, a lot of packages that depend on that, um, which is fine. What is less fine is the issue that um, that there are two packet, two other packages, RGDAL and RGOS, that basically link the SP classes to, to GDAL, where GDAL reads and writes things to, to file formats. And Geos does geometry operations, right? Does intersections and unions and buffers and everything. Uh, so these are two basically external libraries that are not linked to SP, but that SP uses, or to some extent, or that that basically uh, loading these packages needed to to do things. And um, you can see here RGDAL bindings for the geospatial data library. You can even see that. Uh, that uh, RGDAL is quite a bit older than SP, right? So that there were already GDAL bindings in 2003, I think also uh, written by, uh, by Timothy Keat, Keat, Tim Keat, uh, who is very good in sort of coming with wild new ideas and then quickly dropping them, yeah? That's so looking for somebody else to maintain them and so on. So, so he did a sort of a first rough version for reading things and so on. Uh, but uh, ideas of him are still in that package. But now what is happening is that uh, that Roger Bivent, who, who started sort of uh, all this whole community thing essentially, um, retired last year or two years ago, or, or retired in the in a recent uh, past, and is also going to retire from the maintenance of this uh, package, and not only of this package, but also of the RGOS package. And these packages, that means the, they are going away. Yeah, we're now in a project where we are looking at uh, uh, basically, at all the packages that that those packages that reuse this software 
and and seeing you know what is going to happen with that and uh, they have to basically they have to act and and sort of um, be aware that these packages are going away and and migrate and the migration basically takes place in the direction of a package called sf which is um, also on cron uh, which is a package that you can see first arrived uh, on cron in 2016 um, and um, well in a pretty unusable form but anyway it was an was a sort of an event adventure and um, sf tries to do things with uh, vector data uh, in a in a better way in several respects in the sense that um, it doesn't look at shape files anymore but it looks at simple features simple features now a well established standard for uh, for representing uh, vector data yeah points lines polygons and combinations of those and ver varieties like uh, multi polygons and so on so and, and deals in a, in a very unambiguous way with uh, you know what is an outer ring and what is an what is an hole at least uh, if you're in a two-dimensional uh, flat space living in a flat space so as sf is simple features is a is a standard um doesn't so much link to uh to the standard but if you look at the simple feature access OJC, then you will see that there's a standard called simple feature access which uh which describes uh where you can can find these these documents here they are um and you can download them you can see how they what is basically the meant by according to the uh, open gis implementation the open geospatial consortium implementation was meant by by that senator. You also see that this is a document from 2006, yeah? and there's an earlier version from 2005. So that was sort of also in the time that we were that we had been writing uh, uh, SP, and that other people were standardizing this. And so it took a while before we said, okay, now we're going to do completely different. Another aspect that we did different that we did differently in the design from SP to uh, to SF. Is that um, that SF completely depends on the uh, package methods and it use, uses the so-called S4 classes. Yeah, so this is something. This is a, a, a one way of doing uh, object-oriented uh, uh, programming uh, in R, uh, and they are called um, they are called S4 classes. Um, and in the time that we are we were um, that we were writing SP. Uh, that was really the sort of the common um, understanding that although there wasn't a useful uh, older paradigm called S3, that S4 would really be the thing that would replace it. Yeah, there was even the our documentation would tell like we believe that that modern work that new things will use S4 rather than S3. Yeah, that was sort of a common and we saw that in those days and we still see that a, a project like Bioconductor, uh, Bioconductor. Um, is a is an, um, a, a collection of, of R packages dedicated to bioinformatics. And that collection is entirely built on and uses S4 all throughout the whole uh, set. And this is basically what what a lot of uh, bioinformaticians uh, use in their daily uh, in their daily work. So it is something that is that works and that that does a that does a good job. Um, nevertheless. We uh, we decided to uh, to drop that and to uh, when we went to doing things in SF to use S3 classes uh, for the simple reason that uh, we figured out that um, S4, S4 classes objects did not uh, work very well with uh, what what came up later and what was called the tidyverse and that is a set of packages that was uh, developed and promoted strongly by our studio. And that is used by a lot of people to, you know, to simplify uh, data analysis. So to do things that you, most of the things you can also do with base R functions, but a lot of people think that tidyverse uh, does it either better or in a nicer way. And there's a lot of uh, tooling that actually our studio uh, developed that that is where there are no alternatives for, like uh, tidyverse proxies to big databases and some something like that with dbplyr and there is no you know that's i think those are really really good things so it is and 
it is a that is a, a paradigm that's used a lot in in education and and so we used so for that reason with uh, with the package sf we went back to basically uh creating objects that are essentially data frames yeah so s3 classes and and we extend data frames or we extend tables which is the tidyverse uh data frame and, uh, and and do that yeah so that is a bit of history um this was also uh sf was also developed as an uh, our consortium funded project so there was a lot of uh interaction with uh, with several people from the uh, from the from the from the people involved in the in tidyverse or in studio our studio or in um uh, pose it as it is called today um and um they they contributed strongly so one of the things is that we we spend a lot of time in in making uh, ggplot uh suitable for plotting for uh, uh, polygon data yeah that was something that it never could in the in the older sp days it would you know need something called fortify which did something which which tried to write out polygon data in 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 tables and data frames and that never worked yeah that is something that 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 would, would always have its limitations and uh we basically collaborated here strongly in the early stage of this package uh, Hadley and I collaborated, collaborated strongly in sort of, uh, you know, dividing the jobs in, in, in who did. So he did the whole ggplot organization things uh, together with, um, um, I, I see his face, but forgot his name, together with, and uh, with someone else. And, um, and, and Thomas Lynn Peterson was also there involved. Um, and... Um, and and I sort of did the, the the section where we had to understand how these polygons were were structured. Although that is not you know that is not rocket science, uh, but but it was sort of for their uh, art studio doesn't sort of didn't want to didn't want to uh, um, claim the whole spatial area and say okay we are doing spatial we're doing everything and so on. They said okay this is a, this is a sort of uh, a lot of uh you know a, another community yeah that would like to work some of that community would like to work with tidyverse and and we help them we make that possible yeah for instance by uh by making these these tidyverse verbs compatible with sf objects and for instance by making uh, by modifying ggplot such that it can uh, properly plot points lines polygons and so on and and also do a little bit somewhat clever with uh, with uh, projections and 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 axes and, and coordinates and so on um so that was uh that is a little bit of uh, history um i prepared some slides i have not i don't have a slide set sort of to uh, you know to talk you through for the for the whole uh, afternoon session but i will sort of look at uh, at a number of issues um, that are that come up in uh, that come up in in the book that tom just mentioned so there is this website or this uh, this this page where you can find uh, some materials that will come up later that I did prepare for the session of today and, and tomorrow morning. So that is github.com slash adser slash OGH22 with OGH22 capitalized. Uh, and there's a couple of... Uh, um, Quarto files there. So Quarto files is that's going to be explained in the session next door how to do how to do uh, um, you know how to do things reproducibly. Quarto are these these uh, these, these mark are markdown files uh, basically that um, let me look at one that that have a you know little header and then come with with just text in in standard markdown and then with R sections. Which which are between three quotes, back quotes, and have this this art tag here, and then essentially uh, this is being run, this is being executed and echoed, but also the plot is being generated and put in my in my result, right? So this is briefly how we do, uh, you know how you know one way of 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 providing um, annotated analyses yeah you do an analysis your analysis is in the r script but you want to annotate it um you don't want to just put your annotations in comments right because comments are dreadful 
um, but you want to have, you know, and also you want to have sort of a document that, so this is then basically, uh, you could load this in, uh, in, in our studio, for instance. Um, let me just try this to do this. I never know how to download a thing like this. Maybe I, I ask for the raw and then click for save as. It is my poor man's way of downloading this thing. So I'll put it in slash TMP and then see if my R Studio is already equipped uh, and knows that it should now open this thing. I hope, never tried. Yeah, it starts R Studio with this thing. So R Studio knows that this isn't something that it likes. Um, and then, uh, and then I have this thing uh, and one of these buttons says render the current document. Yeah, and that basically says make something that uh, that run these R, R chunks, run these R chunks, and then put everything together in, the, in a document, right? And the document is then here, so that opens in a web browser and, and sees my, my render document. Yeah, so I, I see the, uh, the R sections in, in gray. Is this also gray here? No, it's not, right? I hope it is for the, for the viewers at home. This is a gray box in my, yes. on my screen. And, uh, uh, and so projectors always have a difficulty with light gray boxes. This is great. Um, and, and so here you see sort of R sections and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. uh, response from R, like, like, like messages from R that, that come back and then plots that are being inserted and so on. Yeah, so so we'll, get, we'll get to this document in a while. Um, Right, so this is one way to, uh, that you can deal with these uh, Quarto. Quarto is, is the new thing of our markdown and um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying it out. I haven't seen the light yet, um, but it seems to be good. That's, uh, at least if you believe Twitter, then there's a lot of people who think it's good. Um, the, um, the, the book text that I pointed you to are these chapters one, two, three that we will go through today, uh, for which we have one hour to go. So that's three chapters, that's a lot. Um, and that is the book uh, that I'm now writing and already writing for quite a while. Um, and it's now sort of, it was kind of finished and I now have to update it because things are moving so fast, sort of new developments, czar, geopark, arrow and so on, that I'm, I'm sort of, I'm already, updating my sort of my manuscript, the manuscript, and uh, uh, that's a pity. But, but anyway, this is, the, um, this is the, uh, the, the material that we work through. And um, you will see that that is, so with my course, uh, I usually take one chapter per week. Yeah, so now we have one and a half hour, hour for three chapters, yeah, which is a little bit, a little bit dense. Yeah, so you have to, uh, um, if, if this is, if you think this is very dense, then it's, it is very dense. Yeah. But this is the idea of a summer school, right? That we point you to materials and you can find things. Um, and the idea is that there are exercises at the end of every chapter and the exercises are also very complicated. Yeah. My students, my students have, uh, have serious trouble with, uh, getting the, maybe the first one is okay from the first chapter, it's getting started, but then it's getting uh, rough. Yeah. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the, uh, the work exercise, I think there are some way if you are good at search at web searches, you can find also the answer somewhere on the internet. Um, it basically says, uh, um, here's the first map, right? So this map has sort of was, was created in this way by uh, calling like Tidyverse uh, for the reason that I'm going to, uh, to do um, a Tidyverse verb here. Yeah, we can also use the standard pipe down nowadays, the vertical bar and then the larger than. So I think I already updated the whole text but haven't rendered it yet. Um, so this basically says, okay, I'm going to read a geo package. Yeah, for those of you uh, who haven't heard of geo, who of you has not heard of geo package? Good. Oh, you haven't heard of geo. Have you heard of shape files? So forget about shape files. Geo, <laughs> geo package is the is the new shape file. Yeah, geo package is the uh, is a 
is a file format. The good thing about GeoPackage, it's a single file. Shape files always have three, four, five files and directories and stuff and so on. This is, it's, it's an, uh, it is implemented in SQLite. So it's a database in a, in a file. You can even open it with SQLite and look at the tables and everything. It is very, that sense, very transparent. So we all simple examples, small data sets and so on. We use GeoPackage nowadays. Here, um, we're reading a GeoPackage uh, from the package directory. Yeah? So this is something that once you have, once you have R on your machine somewhere installed and you install this package somewhere, I don't want to know where, uh, this works. Yeah? This basically grabs this file yeah, from uh, the package directory, yeah? which is which is there, otherwise you would have an, you would have an, had an error here, yes? You wouldn't have gotten here. If you can load the package, this file is there. So this is very convenient uh, to, uh, to, um, for, for reading stuff. So if I go to an example session, um, uh, you will see that this is the path, I don't know if you see this, yeah? This is the path uh, where, where my, file is, yeah, so it's, it's very un uninteresting, it happens to be, I think this is standard on Ubuntu installations, except that your home directory uh, will have a different name. Yeah, so, um, Maybe if you could be clear with this one slide. Even more than this? You're kidding. Oh, that was okay. Yeah? Good. Okay, it's just behind the, the screens, I think, yeah, so, so right, so yeah, you can you can see it. It is very uninteresting. It's somewhere and we don't want to, we don't want to know why. Yeah. Um, so this basically reads the file, yeah, and then saves it. This is the the, the right hand assignment, which you know in in my book makes sense after a pipe symbol because things go to the right, right. So this 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 string, yeah, this file name goes into the function read as f. So this is the goes into symbol and then is saved into the object called NC. And then we transform this thing into a new coordinate reference system, which is something that is for this particular data set useful. And then we uh, select a uh, particular variable and um, we basically plot it and we also want to plot the graticule. And here you see that plotting these graticules shows you that we basically have some kind of coordinate reference system, but other graticules are not visible here. But the thing is the graticules are not straight. Yes, they're not, they're not straight lines. Yeah, so the, the straight lines are the original projection. And the graticules are the lines with constant latitude and longitude, which are not straight under this particular projection. Um, yeah, so this is, this is one way of uh, selecting an attribute. So this data set and C basically has these, these, these 100 counties, has 100 records. For all of these counties, it has a number of variables, available attribute variables, and, um, and, and, the, and the geometries, right? So, so here is what we basically see, a first sort of uh, meeting, a first example of uh, simple features. Features are basically things, um, whatever, things in this case, they are counties. Uh, counties are administrative regions and they have properties. And one of the properties is their geometry, which is sort of for every county is the, geom is the, is the polygon. And another property is uh, properties of, is this a biometric data set? These are the number of births in 1974 uh, over some period of time or something like that. Yeah, so this is a sort of an amount, yeah, a number of, number of people being born in a certain period. Um, right, so, um, you know, and all kind of things are there. If you think about the, uh, the polygons, they are, uh, they are really sort of rings, right? So every, for every county, we have, the, we have the, the surrounding ring, the polygon that comes around the county. That means that, that every line that you see between that crosses two uh, counties is, is doubled, yeah? So it's present in both rings. There's a ring here, yeah? And there's a ring here. And the thing they have in common is there twice. Yeah, this is the thing that, that basically we have hundreds of these observations and the, the geometries are just whatever they are. Yeah, they are not in some kind uh, dependent on each other. Another representation would be a topological representation. That is what proper GIS would do, like uh, ArcGIS, I don't know much of that, but in any case, GRASS does that and, and other GISs may, may do that, is basically looking at 
arcs and nodes and looking at, okay, here's a node, there's a node, there's an arc between them or an edge between them. And I'm going to store that once and then tell what is left, what is right, which, which things are there. And it means that you store basically every line piece only once, yeah, which has a, which has a big advantage in the sense that you immediately know for everything sort of are two things neighbors or not. You can then very easily query to that information. If you just have polygons, you have to sort of go through all the possibilities and, and check them geometrically. Yeah, that's what we do. So it's a, it's an, it's a simple, yeah, it's simple. This is not where the simple stands for, I'll come to that. It's a simple representation of data that came out of shapefiles and now is in simple features. Uh, in these geometries, and it, it works for most, uh, it works for a lot of problems very well. Yeah. So that is, uh, so that is there. Uh, other ways of, of doing this is, uh, is basically, uh, yeah, we, here we see a little bit of output coming from, uh, from how this object is plotted. We see that it says, I'm a, I'm a simple feature collection, so it's set of, uh, yeah, with 100 features, that means 100 records. And this one has three fields, yeah, three attributes, uh, in addition to the geometry. Uh, and there's a couple of things coming, like what is the geometry type, multi-polygon. That means polygons, but possibly polygons that consist of more than one outer ring, and two-dimensional, and it says I have a bounding box, and I have a geodetic coordinate reference system. Yeah, so this is important, that I have a coordinate reference system. Coordinate reference system basically say, what do your, what do your coordinates mean? Yeah, what are they sort of, how do I interpret these numbers? Uh, geodetic says as much as these are degrees, longitude, latitude. Yeah, so these are not like things like meters in a flat space. No, they are, uh, they are angles. They are degree angles in degrees. And they are associated to a datum, which is called, which is the NAD 27, which is a different datum from the WGS 84 that everyone probably is more familiar with. Uh, NAD stands for North American Datum in 1927. So this is the datum that these data are associated with. And if we look at the first three uh, uh, elements, then we see that we get uh, three, the three variables, or what were they called? Fields, uh, three fields, uh, see them plotted. Um, one called area, which is entirely wrong, but anyway. Um, then the birth 74 and then the SID. 74, it is the sudden infant death uh, rate. Yeah, the sudden infant death is, a, is that young children, whatever, be, you know, younger than a certain age, uh, die for unknown reasons. Yeah, it's a syndrome. And here we see then the, a, a representation of this polygon information. You see here there is a, a variable called multi-polygon, which has a unit called degrees, and we see the, the coordinates, yeah, so the vertices, of the individual uh, points of that of that that ring, yeah, which which should be counterclockwise. So we see all that information basically printed out, um, and we can do that for, uh, and and this is a certain way with these with these brackets that basically makes it relatively easy to to understand if you give it a little bit more thought what a multi polygon is and and that polygons can have holes in them. Um, so this is one way of, of doing this um, or plotting this. Another way is using ggplot, and it's a little bit more involved because here in this in this ggplot plot, we're going to do to give two uh, maps, and this is because this is uh, what was it? Um, what is the variable plotted here? The sudden infant death rates, right? So the variable that we were interested in. Um, and we plot them for, for the two uh, time periods, 74 to 78 and 79 to 84. You need to go to the original documentation of, of this data set to understand where these periods come from. And we see two maps basically, and this is the nice thing about, uh, about facet plots that is really hard to match with other, you know, other plotting systems other than, than, than ggplot. Um, and that can also be sort of relatively difficult to do with, uh, be done with, with, with standard GIS is that you get basically a set of subplots that share axes uh, that just have some kind of label uh, that, that distinguishes them. And this is basically two time instances uh, for the same variable. So we have the same variable, we have a single, uh, a single legend. 
uh, and can by that compare the two years. Yeah, look at which year had the highest values and whether the patterns we see are similar between the two years and so on. <coughs> um, this is a little bit more involved. The, the involvement here is that, uh, that we need to, so we had this, uh, this data set uh, N, uh, NC, which, which, um, which we projected to this, to this uh, uh, coordinate reference system with this identifier. Um, and then we're going to, to use two uh, variables. Yeah? So we select these two variables from this data set. And now if you are a little bit familiar with ggplot and the idea of tidyverse in the paper of Hadley Wickham in 2016 on tidy data, then you know that it doesn't like it if, if a variable is sort of in two columns. Yeah? You need to put these two columns on top of each other and have a second column telling you what is the first set, what is the second set, right? That is the idea of tidy data, that you put out that things that are in many cases, distributed over columns, uh, should not be put in different columns, but should be stacked, right? And this is what pivot longer does, right? So pivot longer does that and says all these columns that start with S idea, which are these two, uh, are going to be put sort of being stacked. But uh, of course, you should be aware here that selecting these two variables, uh, naively, you would say, would also drop the geometry. Right, and that is something we will we do not want. We want sort of we want to okay we want to select these variables, but we would still want to plot them later and have the geometries associated with them. So we uh, essentially we hacked this whole thing and we said okay, there's any you know all of these uh, tidyverse things or uh, all all the time when you're selecting things, you're selecting attributes, but you will keep the geometries. Yeah, so that is basically selects this command selects the uh, these two variables, but keeps the geometries associated with them. And this pivot longer um, also stacks the geometry. So it not only stacks these two variables, but also re repeats the geometry because the first column has the set of geometries. The second column is now underneath it, needs to have the, the same set of geometries. Yeah? So I doubled the geometries here. You don't see that because this is all, uh, you know, there's a this is a, not a data frame, but it's an SF object, and select has an SF method that, that has this sticky geometry idea, and then pivot longer, make sure that the geometries are also stacked. Yeah. So in that sense, you can do, you can just work on your attributes, and because they're SF objects, it, it kind of deals, does the, 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 the natural thing, well, natural, I mean, it's a matter of taste, uh, keeps the geometries and, and handles them, and then you can use geomsf, which was specially written for handling uh, uh, ge geographic data, so fact geographic factor data, uh, and, and sort of pl uh, plots all the geometries in, in both facets, and then colors them according to the, the, the first column and according to the second column, which is now one column that has a, has a second field next to it, which is basically the, uh, the, uh, the thing called name, and that I then uh, want to have um, want to, uh, where did they do that? Anyway, somewhere, somewhere something is going on to also put these year ranges uh, here on the side. Ah, this is happening here. Yeah, so, so here, uh, year labels was created and this is uh, used later on, yeah, with the, with the labeler yeah, special labeler uh, function that uh, that is a part of facet wrap. So facet wrap is the nice thing that creates these facet maps. The facet maps, I think, are incredibly a strong aspect of, of R and of uh, and of tidyverse. Um, another alternative is to put things on the on the uh, on the leaflet based map. This is what what MapView of of Tim Appelhans's fame. Tim of MapView fame uh, does, and that lets you interact with these, uh, with this data, put it, sort of plot it with some kind of transparency that you still see that this is North Carolina, uh, hence the NC, and and it gives some interaction in the sense that if you plot, if you click on a, if you click on a polygon, then you get the whole, uh, all the associated uh, variables, 
and their values for that uh, for that polygon. Yeah, so that as you see that that doesn't sort of work extremely well with my current screen resolution, uh, but um, but works for for normal screen resolutions. So so there we are. So we can do static maps. We can do GT plots. We can do um, interactive maps with map view. Um, Coordinate reference systems are then a big uh, topic, obviously, because they basically say what um, what um, what my coordinates mean, and when I have a certain coordinate, how I'm going to that how I'm, am I going to combine that value with with other data? Yeah, if, if you had just coordinates and wanted to plot things, you wouldn't worry less. But typically, like like here is the case, yeah, you want to plot things on an existing map, right? So I couldn't do this if I didn't have, if I didn't know that these were geographic coordinates in the in this particular datum, and I probably am going to uh, uh, to reproject them before I, I plot them. By the way, it looks like there is not. Well, maybe this coastline is moving. There's a lot happening in North Carolina, I believe. But um, <clears throat> the um, the uh, the meaning of that is basically put in coordinate reference system, and that is a, a relatively large topic. Yeah, so I, there it's basically I give a um, an entire course which is fifty percent on the coordinate reference system. So we're not going to cover that entirely in the next forty five minutes. Um, the other aspect that um, that uh, Jakub already um, talked about uh, this morning is that the aspect of raster and vector data that we have. Uh, you know, we looked at now simple features, which is, as I said, is vector data, point signs, polygons. So things where where coordinates can have an arbitrary precision. Yeah, of course, they have limited precision because we use eight byte doubles uh, to store to represent things. But um, it is it's a high precision and things where we only consider a limited number of locations. Um, and these locations are ordered in a regular um, typically horizontally, vertically oriented uh, raster. Yeah, so that is what we call uh, raster data. Yeah, so what we see here is an image. And what we see here is a little part of this image zoomed out, uh, where you see that these are little, basically little raster cells, uh, where each cell has, a, has, of course, a location, but also has, an, uh, has, an, has a number. Yeah, there is a number, and the number is the data value. Yeah, so that could be whatever. This is probably a digital number from one of the RGB bands or something like that from a color image or, or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and that means that it is scaled from 0 to 255, typically. Uh, and these are then the numbers. So, uh, so you can see here the, the, the raster data. You could, for instance, then uh, query things and say, what, at, at these three points, what are my values? Or under these three circle or circular areas, what are the values that I observe there? And, and do computations, like com combine these two, uh, these two informations. Um, that, is, uh, that is apparently done here with a command extract, where we extract from, an, from, an raster, uh, from a raster uh, representation. We extract at a set of points. We extract the values, and we get basically the the values associated with this with this geotiff uh, file at these three points. We get back the, the three uh, observed values at these three points. Yeah. So so these are operations where you basically combine uh, raster and vector, and you want to do that. Uh, for instance, if you want to do some kind of machine learning and train a model, you have like land use at these points. You want to know what the what the, what the values at these images are in order to build a model and to, to throw the model on the raster image and to get a land use map, something like that. Yeah, that was what the previous talk in this room was, uh, was about uh, in a very rough nutshell. Um, and the same thing we can do for, uh, for polygons, where we could, you know, we could do a buffer around these points. I'll come back to buffer. And then you for these three polygons, we could, for instance, compute the average of the average of the uh, of the uh, raster imagery under um, under these uh, of, of all the raster cells that fall uh, inside this 
inside these these circles yeah there is of course variability so we need to do something with that whatever take the mean or the maximum whatever we are interested in um There's a question. yes sure go ahead functions uh, can we run in parallel with any idea about something like that oh um larger object things can be well you know you could um so so this function this particular aggregate function i would have to look that up whether that has infra some of the functions in the packages that I'm using uh, do the, do have that. Uh, I think this is aggregate in stars. I mean, we but um, these pieces, so yeah, exactly. So I see here. Here are no with with aggregate. There are no. Um, there is one function that is called st apply that that applies functions, for instance, time serial classifiers or something. That's more. This is this is usually not very compute intensive. But if you wanted to if you wanted to parallelize that, you could uh, write an outer loop, right? You could say, well, I want to do this for hundred thousand circles. Yeah, I'm going to do that in uh, hundred threads, each taking a subset of thousand circles. You could, if you have hundred cores, you could do it like that. Yeah, that would be relatively easy, and then you wait until it's done, and you put your results back together in a single call. That would be so. You would have to write your to manage your own parallelization. Um, this is a nice question. So parallelization, of course, performance is very important, and uh, you know, there's always a lot of people that uh, that spend a lot of time on on, on comparing performance and so on. Um, the um, writing. Writing code that uses threads or that uses parallel mechanisms is always has a bit of the risk that you uh, that that you interact that you interfere with other parallel mechanisms. Yeah, if I write a function that starts with taking all the cores that are available, and you are calling that function in your own parallelization framework, yeah, where you want to chunk something up in in sort of yeah, then we get you know then one bites the other. Yeah, then I'm trying to instead of Use my hundred cores. I'm using. I'm calling hundred functions in parallel that each, you know, call for hundred cores, and then and then things things clash. So anything that is parallel, for instance, as the apply has has infrastructure for that. Uh, here you can give the the cluster and progress and future and so on. So this this does the standard parallel things. This uses the future parallelization. Uh, can can use these plans if you if you instrument it if you tell it to do so it will not do that spontaneously yeah there is doing that spontaneously is a is a bit of a I I'm, I don't know I, I think uh, for instance Terra does that yeah if you look at the Terra code then it's it's full with threading and so on and and that might you know solve a lot of problems for its users whereas whereas users of this still have to think about that themselves before they before they actively do it. Um, right, so here are factor and, and things you can, uh, you know, that was sort of getting uh, getting raster data from vector. You can also get uh, from vector data. You can you can you can create rasters. You can rasterize things. So this is a rasterization of these uh, of these uh, birth rates, right? So these are births for this period, and of course there you already see the problem, right? That I had this original map uh, here at the start, which is the same map where you can see, oh yeah, here is a yeah, here is a state with very high birth rates, right? Over 20,000, that is the highest from this whole area. And if you then sort of compare that to the, uh, to the rasterized version that they just showed here, um, you in, and essentially you have the rasterized vectors, right? But the, if you look at this area, then um, it's no longer clear that this is a single county, yeah? So we're looking at amounts here amounts that are associated to polygons uh, now we get raster cells and we see that there are suddenly like 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 30 or 40 raster cells that have this very high uh, value um, and it's no longer clear that these are sort of that these are a unity in a sense of a spatial unity yeah this is only this is only once 20 thousands it's not like 20 thousands is associated to each raster cell yeah, so this is, of course has a has an enormous risk of uh, of doing things with data which is which is improper. Uh, yeah, so reading 
at, at, a, at some kind of raster reading values from polygons that are not you know, associated for that value. Um, it, would, it would be okay if the value were like a land use or so, you know, something that is constant throughout the area, but in this case it's not. Yeah? So this is one of the exercises, like what is wrong with this map. Um, raster types, there's a couple of different raster types. We saw the regular raster type where we have square raster cells that are vertical and horizontal oriented, which is the standard one. We can also rotate this thing or shear this thing, yeah, which gives us sort of uh, transformed regular rasters. We can also have rectilinear rasters where we have uh, varying cell sizes, but still uh, simply uh, oriented along, along the main axis. Uh, this is something we see often in, uh, in a time dimension, right? Where we have temporal data and we have monthly observations, for instance. And month lengths are of different, months are of different length, at least uh, in most calendars. Yeah. Um, so this is something that happens regularly. Another thing is curvilinear rasters where we have uh, um, essentially, you know, things that are regular in some way, yeah, but uh, in the end, for every raster cell, you need to look up uh, a coordinate or, or four coordinates of the of the corners. This is something where you think, why you know, why would you ever do that? Um, it happens more often than you think. There's a lot of Earth observation uh, observational data, for instance, Sentinel Five, where where you see we we, we have these swaths, these these things where these uh, these broom sensors or whatever are are are, are observing where the the cell sizes at the at the outside are much larger than in the middle, right? Because we have we have this angle and we, we take a, a relatively broad path of the uh, of the Earth. So this is one one way where it happens to um, because of observation. Another case is that it happens uh, because of modeling because people use longitude latitude grids, but because this grid is kind of doesn't have the nice thing. Sort of all the grid cells meet each other at the North Pole. They just uh, they rotate the poles, right? They say, "Okay, I'm going to rotate a pole," and then my polar region has a nice sort of uh, latitude longitude grid coverage. The way it is usually at the equator, but it's now at the pole, and then I'm going to rotate back, and then you end up with these kind of curvilinear things. Uh, a lot of NetCDF files have them, or ZAR files these days. Um, and the thing that I'm going to talk about tomorrow morning is, is that of time series array, uh, arrays and data cubes, which is basically the uh, next thing, which is kind of when I have uh, multiple raster images or time series of raster images or other raster or, or time series of, uh, of features like time series of stations, which are also data cube, vector data cube information. Um, an important aspect that is also that comes back in chapter five that I may also um, uh, talk about tomorrow morning is, is that of support. And that is basically the, um, the, the physical size of, uh, of, of your observation, right? So my observation in the North Carolina data set was a birth, amounts of births, right? And the question is, what are these births associated with? Well, they are county-wise, right? So they are associated with the county. So it's, it's basically an aggregate. I have counted births over a certain time frame and over a certain region and end up with an aggregate. If I had said, what is the, uh, what is the property of, um, of my county name? Yes, county name is another property. Then you could argue, well, that is everywhere the case in this county, but nowhere else, right? So you have kind of an identity relationship. Other things like uh, land use, if I have a land use map, I have something that is, although associated with a polygon, is essentially valid in every point in that polygon. So I'm, if I'm going to rasterize that, no problem, yeah, because I believe that all points in my polygon have this, uh, have this value. Um, SF objects have some infrastructure to deal with this kind of things and to point you out that you're making certain assumptions if, you, if you're not aware that you're doing this and ways of, of sort of specifying this. So if you have an aggregate property and you're querying that at a point, then you get a warning that says, well, this is, you know, although you get the value of the po that point, your context is lost, your support is lost. You get a point associated with a birth amount, with an amount of people, and the context is that county, but you lose, you're losing that. Yeah? So you're losing the support context. And that is a problem. That is typically a start of an error. 
Yeah. So so this is kind of why we uh, why we raise warnings there. Um, if if things are constant, then it's usually okay, right? If I have something like uh, uh, whatever it's constant altitude or something, oh, that's not so likely. Constant altitude. Uh, well, yeah, you could have a constant altitude. You could have a contour values, right? And then a constant class between them. It's everywhere. Contour lines. Yeah, contour lines are an interesting <clears throat> type of data. I mean, the region between uh, uh, Klaus Wilke, that was the name of uh, the guy who worked, did a lot of work on, on ggplot for SF. Um, right, this is also that's something that, uh, that uh, Jakub already uh, showed this morning, is that all these packages that we are, we are developing uh, for spatial data uh, reuse a lot of software that basically comes from other communities, largely from the OSGO community here, TOS, Proj, GDAL, LIP, LWGO, uh, but also the uh, atmospheric community, NetCDF, UCAR, uh, units comes from UCAR, S2 geometry comes from Google. Yes, S2 geometry does geometric operations on the sphere and is an uh, open source uh, Google library. Um, right, uh, GDAL is one thing there, Proj is for geometry, CDF and so on. Good. Uh, how am I doing? Yeah. So, so that was um, spending an hour on chapter one. But chapter one covers a lot of things. That so I can basically skip through uh, chapter two. Chapter two says uh, data are not just numbers; they are numbers with context. Yes, and in the data analysis, context provides meaning. This is a nice sort of interpretation of what data, uh, with data, essentially is. Uh, and it is uh, hard to overlook the, the meaning and the importance of, of context. Yeah? And it's also hard to define it. You could, you could say, well, context is metadata, but it's not, right? Context is also the variable name, the unit of the variable, and so on. Coordinates, the uh, meaning of coordinates, of course, goes back to, uh, to quantities, you know, measured values. Measured values always have all kinds of things, like a measurement have a dimension, sort of what is the thing, is this a speed or is it a length, uh, and have a, have a measurement unit, right? Which unit is this being expressed? Those are the two things that you, that you can never miss. And the last thing is, of course, the measurement error, right? That should be part of the measurement and a measurement process and is all too often uh, ignored or thrown away or whatever. Um, so we rarely see coordinates with, uh, with measurement errors on them, right? Uh, but anytime we, of course, we look at GPS data, we know, you know, what a mess GPS data is. And that there is always 10 meters, 10 meters error, and that this error can have very complicated structure. Um, as I said, there are two types of uh, two types of coordinates, and they're one. The main thing is that they're ellipsoidal or they are uh, or they are Cartesian, right? So ellipsoidal means I have an angle. This is on this is an, in a flat space. I can uh, measure sort of a point on this circle by measuring this angle. I can also measure it by measuring the x and y coordinate, which is the which is the which are the Cartesian coordinates. Yeah, so Cartesian coordinates have a length unit, <coughs> where uh, polar or angular coordinates have an have an angle, so have the number of degrees or radians as as units. Uh, and on the sphere, this is the same thing. So we can measure points on the sphere with so-called geocentric coordinates, which is the coordinate in the x, y, and z dimension, uh, where, where these x, y, and z are three orthogonal dimensions. And we can do this by uh, two angles, the um, longitude and the latitude. Yes, those are the two angles that we can use. Of course, this point has to be then, right, we can do this for any point. Uh, and with the two angles, the point has to be on the, on the sphere. Right, so of course there is a third dimension, which would be the altitude of the point, the height of the point, uh, relative to, you know, gravity or relative to the direction of the center of the Earth or whatever. These are different heights. So there's a there's a third dimension, but typically for geo we talk about points on the Earth, right? First of all, except in the previous talk where where there was also elevation in the atmosphere, right? So there things get tougher. 
So these are important uh, things. Uh, we can uh, represent them like this. Uh, for two dimensions, we can represent them with like this. This is well-known text representation. Um, and uh, basically, we have ellipsoidal coordinates, so there's also the thing that you need to take into account whether, whether you have the uh, geodetic or the geocentric um, uh, angles, that, uh, latitudes that you're looking at, which, of course, is not as bad. You know, the, the Earth is not as flat as this, luckily, but they are two different angles. Um, and then there's different ways to, to uh, handle that. There's the PROJ software that is uh, sort of, that is used by the whole OSGEO stack and that now uses a way of uh, encoding um, coordinate reference systems that is uh, called WKT2, which is also an OGC standard uh, that has texts like this, right? Uh, as for WGS84, which is these days already um, a lot more complicated. Oh no, this is this is this. This is still that is still the same. Yeah, but I I think that is it's now WGS84 is essentially a datum ensemble, which means a handful like five different realizations. Yeah, which which is another thing that we like shape files that we are essentially supposed to stop using. Yeah, but. I don't think we are that far uh, already. Um, so this is what I wanted to say about um, about coordinate and coordinate reference uh, systems. Yes. You know, your recommendation to discuss uh, some projection system with uh, equal area projection which you can use globally universally. Um, yeah, global projection. So yeah, that is a good point. Um, if you. Uh, Yeah, I think um, so. If you do global uh, global maps, then so the, the larger your region uh, is, the you know the more a projection distorts from reality. Yeah, if I have a large, if I have a smaller region like like Sigburg, it wouldn't, you know, it's 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 nearly flat. At least the ellipsoid is here nearly flat, so projection doesn't matter. But for larger areas, it matters. Um, <coughs> I would say, uh, Tom, that really depends, and I'm not a cartographer, uh, but that really depends on the, on the applications. And um, if you get, uh, you know, you know that projections with strong distortions of area, like the like Web Mercator, like Mercator, or so, are of course outrageous in the sense that they that you think that Greenland is as large as Africa, or so, right? Um, so I think for most for most mapping applications, uh, equal area. Uh, projections are are just good, are good to go, and there there are, there's a handful of different ones, and uh, to some extent that's a matter of taste. But in this case, if you want to for polygons, want to know what's the what's the area in uh, flat zone like that for triple six, uh, you have to reproject and then estimate the area. No, you can compute uh, areas either assuming it's a sphere or assuming it's an ellipsoid. So you can compute areas only ellipsoid. Yeah, that would be the best thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I think by default it it uses a spherical approximation, which is probably good enough for most purposes. Uh, but you can you can sort of pull down the uh, the the ellipsoidal computations, which are uh, you know fully accurate. They sort of have sixteen digits accuracy, but they're very slow to do. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a speed, uh, it's, it's a speed accuracy trade-off there. Whether you do this spherical or ellipsoidal, but you can do this. This indeed uh, for areas for area computations, uh, you're always best off, of course, uh, uh, unprojected. Not not uh, with do that on unprojected data, or if you have an equal area projection, then areas are not distorted, right? So, so that would should also work. Um, finally, for the for the session of uh, today is the topics uh, the topic of geometry. So I will go now a little bit deeper in that. Uh, I mentioned there's point lines and polygons, and there's a little bit more to it uh, in the sense of what kind of types do we have, uh, and there is also into it the things we can do with them, the operations on geometries, yeah, which are of interest. Um, and then there is the there is the issue of uh, coverages, which I may get to. Or may not. 
Yeah, so simple feature geometries come from the word simple feature and by simple, we, uh, by feature, as I said, we mean things, yeah? Things that are, that are, and things that are have a geometry, right? They are somewhere, so they have a location. And if they are larger than a point, they may have like, you know, an, a polygon geometry or something like that, yeah? So, so me as a person, uh, of course, you know, thinking of me as a, as a, as a flat geo object, you would sort of draw sort of my, you would put a, put a light on top of me and draw my, draw my shade, right? And that would be the, the polygon, sort of the two dimensional surface that I, that I occupy or where I cause, you know, the, the, the sun to, you know, where I cause shade or something like that. Uh, of course, things are three dimensional, but here we're talking mostly about uh, geospatial applications that are um, a lot of the time uh, two dimensional. Uh, geometries are represented by simple features and uh, simple feature geometries includes a class hierarchy, a set of operations and binary, uh, binary and text encodings. Yeah? So a way how we can uh, read and write them basically and communicate them. Uh, the symbol comes from, uh, I don't know whether it says here, ah yes, it, the symbol here uh, refers to the fact that the line or polygon geometries are represented by sequences of points connected with straight lines that do not self-intersect. Yeah, so that is what simple means. So we have points and straight line between them. So that means we don't have curves, like uh, like an equation that gives you the that gives you the curve or, of a circle or something like that, or a, a sine function or something like that. Like functionals that are smooth, differentiable, and so we don't have that. We just have straight lines between points. So we have sequence of coordinates and connected with straight lines. That's it. And these lines are not going to self-intersect. You watch out, right? Then it's no longer simple. Yeah, so this is a very simple uh, recipe. Uh, and if you have something that's curved, you're going to essentially put a lot of points on it so that it, so that it uh, uh, approximates the curve sufficiently. Yeah, that's the solution, that's the way out to, uh, to that problem. Um, the, um, um, question mark here that you could ask, like, yeah, but what does straight mean, right? Uh, straight, of course, uh, is straight, yeah, this sort of straight is the shortest path, right, in, in Euclidean geometry. Yes. So if we think Euclidean geometry, then that's okay. But if we think of points on the earth, points on the earth, points on the sphere, and we have two points, and we think Euclidean geometry, then this is the straight line, means this, the line through the earth, yeah? Not the line over the earth, because that is a curve, that is an, 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 what is it? An arc segment, a circle segment. Yeah, so straight lines are, uh, are okay if you have, you know, if you have two-dimensional geo things that are basically projected. If you have things on the sphere, um, like, you know, like geodetic coordinates, you have to think what you mean by straight. Yes, it is, and the typical, the simplest thing there is that we follow the surface and we take the shortest path, right, from A to B over that surface, yeah? which is not straight. This is just a little point. Uh, and this standard is notably uh, sort of didn't go into that issue. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, issues with the simple feature standard that, is, that make it clear that it, it has been thought of for two dimensional flat data and not for things on the sphere. Okay, then we know that, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's not used by everyone for geodetic coordinates and for sphere, as we saw in the previous chapter in chapter one, right? We saw there were geodetic coordinates in simple feature, yeah, in multi-polygons. Uh, so everyone does that and then, and then hell breaks loose. Um, so there is the, the typology and the, the big seven, basically the seven main uh, things that are being used are point, multi-point, line string, multi-line string, polygon, multi-polygon and geometry collection, yes? So multipoint, you can think of if there is like uh, in your table, there is like a record that says bus station, and then you have all the coordinates of the bus stations, right? That would be a multipoint geometry. You could of course also have a lot of 
records, each of them bus station and each of them with a single point geometry, right? It's not, there's an alternative. But multi-point is basically for there if you have more than one point. Um, Multi-line string is more obvious. Yeah, you have a line string, but you have not one, but you have several of them. And multi-polygon is the same thing. You have sort of several polygons. Yeah, for administrative data, you always have that if you have something, a mainland and a set of islands or something like that. Um, and and they, are, they consist of a set of polygons. Yeah, so a set of these, of these things. And polygons uh, consist, a polygon consists of an exterior ring with zero or, or more inner rings, yes? And the inner rings, so the follow, the secondary rings are all uh, holes, yes, in them. Um, yeah, so you wonder why is there a polygon, a line string? Couldn't we just have a multi-line string that could have one line string, right? So we could have get, gotten, life would have been much easier, I think, if we got rid of this one and that one. Um, also, geometry collection, you get sometimes operations generate a geometry collection if you're, you do something and the result is a point and a polygon and, and they are together what, what, you know, what you were looking for and it's a geometry collection. Yeah, like, like here we have a polygon, two points and a line string and it's a geometry collection. And the typical thing to do with geometry collection is try to get rid of all the things that you don't want to have in it, right? Because typically you're only interested in the polygon. Um, so these are things, and this is also, this is the way they are represented as text. Yeah, so this is kind of speaks for itself. Point has, has two coordinates, multi-point has, then, and then you see this is the first point, comma, the second point, and the points are between parentheses. This line string has a set of nodes and then straight lines between them and so on, right? So you see here the multi-polygon comes with three parentheses is because the polygon comes with two and the polygon comes with two because it's an outer ring, yeah? followed by an inner ring. Yeah, so it needs to have this, this level of the first ring and following rings. And then the multi-polygon is a set of these polygons. Yeah, so it needs one level of parentheses more. That is why we see all these parentheses. So these are text representations, which are you know, somewhat useful because you can use them and everywhere you see them where somebody uses text, but they're typically not used for communicating information because if you have floating point numbers, then using text for them is a bad idea. So we have also binary representations of uh, having these things. Uh, other thing is that we have uh, particular checks, the operations that we can do on them. Uh, so for instance, if we have uh, this thing that we can see <clears throat> that, uh, that this line string is an invalid uh, it's, it's not a simple line string because it has a self-intersection. Yeah, this does basically this, right? Crosses itself. And um, we can also have um, uh, polygons that are invalid. For instance, if we have, an, uh, if we have a hole that, 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 that is not completely inside the exterior ring, that could, of course, not be true and so on. Um, or it could sort of run twice over the same uh, edge and that is also not, prob not proper. Um, an important property of, uh, of the simple feature uh, standard is that it has empty geometries as an, as an object, yes, as a possibility. Yes? So we have, for instance, the point empty. And that is what something that we get when we, for instance, do an intersection, when we look at sort of where, where do we find sort of which, which points do two points have in common? When the first point is here and the other point is here, well, of course, they have nothing in common. So the question like, what do they have in common is the empty point, yeah? And that is sort of the geometry that says, well, there are no points for which, yeah? So you ask something, you do a predicate, you ask something, what are the, what are the points where there is some commonality of these two geometries? And there are no, right? So, so that is a very useful uh, a concept that is also something that is part of the um, simple feature standard and that we never implemented in SP uh, or before because you think you don't need it, right? It's a little bit like the value zero when you count, right? We did a lot of time, we managed to count uh, without zeros and then the Arabs came and they told about zero. So it's a little bit the same thing and it's, uh, it's, a, useful, uh, it's a useful thing. 
There are here 10 further geometry types that are hardly ever used. Yeah, they are uh, exotic and you will not easily run into them. If you do, you will probably try to get rid of them as soon as possible. Or, or do exotic things with, with triangles and meshes and so on. <clears throat> Um, important are the, uh, are the operations that we do on jump trees because a lot of the stuff in uh, a lot of the GIS work is basically uh, operations on geometries. And there are three types that are discussed in this chapter. The three types are the predicates, the measures, and the transformations. And the predicates are the logical assertions, assert, asserting that a certain property is true. For instance, I have geometry A and B. Are these two geometries uh, geometrically equal, meaning that they represent the same set of points? That could be a question. Um, a measure is, for instance, something like an area, a length of a line string, and so on. Uh, transformations are things like uh, buffers, <clears throat> but you could also have transformations that, that look at pairs of geometries. For instance, if I have two polygons that partly overlap, how do we compute the union of them? Right, so the, the set of points that falls in both of, or in either of them, or how do I compute the intersection of those two, or the, diff the, the geometrical difference of them. So uh, operations of these three types can be unary, that means that I operate on a single geometry, like I already had the predicate, is this line string symbol, single, uh, sorry, simple, or is this polygon valid? Uh, binary would be like, uh, um, a binary uh, measure would, for instance, be a distance between two polygons, or they can be anary, meaning that they operate on a set uh, at the same time instead on pairs of two. <clears throat> so the unary predicates um, are here, is simple, is valid, is empty, are things that you could ask. <clears throat> uh, binary predicates are... Um, uh, here we see um, uh, binary predicates are basically um, coming from, well, it's a long list of binary predicates. Let me start there. Um, that is, for instance, contains, right? Does A contain B? Does A contain B properly? Does A cover B? Is A covered by B? Do A and B cross? Are A and B disjoint? are A and B equal, meaning geometrically equal, right? So they might, might have a different order of nodes, but still uh, reflect the same set of points. Or equals exact, meaning that the node order is also identical. Uh, do A and B intersect, meaning they have one or more points in common? Yeah, these are all um, uh, predicates that are defined in a very uh, clear mathematical way using these nine-dimensionality intersection uh, um, um, a description, which basically looks at uh, the inside, the border, and the outside of, a, uh, of, of, an, of two, uh, of two uh, geometries, and then looks at the dimensionality of their, um, of their intersection. Yeah? So if I have here this line string, and I have uh, this, polygon, then I could look at the inside of the polygon and the inside of the line, and what they have in common is this red line, yeah, except for this point, because this point is the boundary of the line, yeah, point is boundary of the line. So the boundary inside of the polygon, the boundary of the line is this point, the inside of the polygon and the exterior of the line is, of course, the whole inside of this polygon. And there, you cannot make all these nine combinations from ins inside boundary exterior for the one geometry inside boundary exterior for the other geometry, and you get nine dimensionalities, and these nine numbers sort of line up, and these nine numbers are basically the code or sort of the, the signature for the geometrical relation between these two geometries, and this signature then uh, ends up in, into something like like a string, uh, and that string can be related to all of these properties. Yeah, I think there is a link here to the Wikipedia page of the dimensionally extended nine intersection model. <coughs> um, and um, 
this article may be too technical for most readers to understand. Look at that. Well, it's not too technical for you. Um, and it has these, this uh, table later on that, uh, let me just make this a little bit smaller, uh, where you can see uh, these, uh, these expressions that basically refer to that, that signature, right? So, so these are false and true are basically wild cards for, for the dimensionality. False means uh, no, zero, true means one, two, or three. Um, and uh, here you can basically see what are the what are the conditions for each of the uh, of the predicates uh, to to find out why you, why you find something that you didn't expect yeah because that is what's happening you're looking at uh, something where you think oh does a overlap b and let's see if a overlaps b and you get some some results which you don't expect and then you think why is this and then it is because overlaps is defined in a certain way you have to go back to that definition, the geometrical definition, yeah, the real predicate, sort of where this goes. So that is something that is uh, that is very useful. Um, unary measures are here a set dimension, for instance, zero points, one for linear, two for polygons. Area is a measure that gives uh, the area of of your of your uh, polygon uh, or zero for points or lines, and the length is the length of linear geometry. Binary measures we can have distance. Uh, unary transformers are a number of them. We can compute a centroid of a geometry, we can compute a buffer, so we make the geometry larger or we make it smaller if we take a negative buffer. We can jitter things, that means sort of randomize, randomly move it around. Um, line merge, make valid. Make valid is a very useful thing if you have invalid polygons. You can use make valid to make them valid. Uh, a number of things, there's a long list of uh, of uh, transformers. A number of them are just convenience functions like collection extract means, you know, extract the polygons from my geometry collections, yeah, which is just a convenience, get rid of all these other things and so on. Um, there are binary transformers where we have intersection, union difference and sim difference, right? Intersection gives sort of the overlap of, of two geometries Union gives their, their geometrical uh, combination. Difference is kind of where you can sort of cookie cut parts out of a polygon, for instance, if you say A minus B, uh, your symmetric difference does it both ways. And there are binary transformers like this. Here you would like to, with, with binary, uh, binary intersections, basically, you get for, for, three, um, for three geometries, three squares, you get all the combinations, right? Uh, but what you would like to have is basically also the area where uh, all three of these things are overlapping, right? And that happens here. And that's not what you get from a binary intersection, right? Because that gives you only this area and then that area for those two overlaps and then this area for the area where these two overlap, right? So entry intersections looks at sort of what are, the, what are all the possibilities from n geometries and that is something that is extremely useful, for instance, if you do uh, species distributions, right? If you have GBIF data and um, distribution of, of, of species and you want to count how many uh, or where are the areas where a particular set occurs or how, what are the air, how many species occur in a certain area. Otherwise, if you don't do it like this, you would have to do it in a raster setting and that, of course, has all kinds of other things. Symmetric difference works in the same way where you do a sequential difference. You basically subtract A and B from C and then you subtract uh, B from C in this order if you do it in a certain order. Uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about precision, but it is a useful thing to know about. <clears throat> the problem essentially is that we are working with uh, floating point numbers and doing operations on them like does this point fall on this line and that typically if it should fall on this line it doesn't yeah because it is a floating point approximation so uh, so we precision basically means that we can do some kind of rounding control the amount of rounding we do so that a lot of things that we would think should happen uh, actually happen if you don't do it you also get a lot of unexpected results like points not falling on the line 
not because it doesn't fall in line, but because we use floating point arithmetic to approximate uh, our answer and don't do it wrong. Tessellations are an interesting uh, um, um, aspect of uh, also of uh, vector geometry. Tessellations are basically subdivisions of space in a limited set of uh, spaces, right? And if we go back to our um, if we go back to our uh, first map that we have here, uh, this one, then we see here that, um, that of course, that we have North Carolina, right? And we subdivide it in, uh, in 100 counties, right? And there is no space that is, of course, North Carolina only has 100 counties, right? So everything is covered, right? So we know that everything is covered. The question is, is this, has this been subdivided in such a way that every point occurs in maximally one county, yeah? And that the problem is that the way we do this with, uh, with polygons this way, with basically rings and another ring, uh, is that it doesn't happen. Because if we have a point on a boundary, right, then if we ask which county is this in, we get the answer, well, it's part of this county, and the point is part of this county. Yeah, and that is, of course, um, well, the question whether that is true or not. Um, in any case, it means that we don't have a tessellation because the area is not subdivided. There are points that are parts of two geometries. Yeah? And if you, are, if you are part of two geometries, you can't have a tessellation because tessellations uniquely subdivide an area. So this is something that, we, that, that goes wrong basically by a polygon geometry, right? Um, you could do this more properly if you had a topological model, if you kept the lines and the nodes and have every line only once, every, every edge, and then say, well, the line is part of the thing on the right. Yeah, so I know how to how define it. Uh, another place where this goes right is raster tessellations, because raster tessellations are not sort of small polygons, rings, but basically say that my raster starts somewhere, yes, and includes this starting point, and then has a cell side, but doesn't include the end of the cell. Yeah, so the, rust, the raster cell starts at its left edge, but stops before its right edge. Yes, and it stops, sorry, it starts at its top edge, but it stops at its bottom edge. Yeah, so the, so the bottom left, typically, if we, if we count raster cells, uh, going down and going right, yes, then uh, the top left point is part of the raster cell and, um, and, the, um, and the left and top uh, edges, except for the final point, uh, are also part of the raster cell. So we see here that if we do an intersection of the raster cells with this line, then we see that all these cells, of course, on the diagonal are covered, but also these cells, which have a point, that is the corner point, in common with this line. Yeah, so this is the way uh, this line is rasterized. And it is completely true, yes? It is completely in accordance with our model, our topological model of the tessellation of this space. Yes, it's of course, uh, it's a cooked up, you know, a cooked up example where you think, look, not the way you want to, but this is the model we are, we are looking at. Um, I, I realize that I'm, yeah. And there's so many of these functions that are available in GDAL genomic classification. And... Uh, I, think this is a, I think this is a function in GDAL that is being used. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so this is done with, uh, with uh, stars and uses ST rasterize. <clears throat> and that, uh, let me see what it does. Wow. Um, I thought that calls out here, it calls out to SF, and SF has the GDAL functions, yeah? And SF does a C++ function call to CPL rasterize, which is GDAL, oh, yeah? Okay, okay. So this calls GDAL ah, okay. to rasterize, yeah. That it's, it's that it's no, 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 no overlaps, it's a few as few as possible. Um, I realize that I'm over, I'm out of my time now, 
Um, so there's one little thing that I actually, what I wanted to show you, which I prepared, which is this raster vector thing where I show a little bit more uh, on, on how this works uh, and sort of the question like, uh, you know, are these, let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, are, is this object, which is, this is an, an, a raster, 10 by 10 raster object, yeah, plotted here with, with random numbers. And this is the same thing, but uh, represented as polygons, square polygons, yeah? So the question like, are these the same sort of geometrical objects? Uh, here you see the first one uh, plotted, which says I'm a 10 by 10 raster sort of structure. This one says, no, I am 100 polygons. Yeah, I have 100 polygons, the first 10 are here. Yeah, so these are the 100 polygons, which is a different way of representing the same, same thing. And then the question is what happens if I look at a certain point, like the point at 0 0.5, 0 0.5, which falls in the middle of this first cell, uh, which is not, you know, the first cell is of course here, so this is cell 91. Uh, where do I, you know, where is this? Yes, this is indeed in cell 91. Whatever I do, whether I do this with the, uh, with the raster object, the stars object, or with the vector representation. However, if I, uh, here it is, if I put this, do this with a line that falls on the border of two cells, yeah, which could have the coordinates one, x coordinate one, and uh, y coordinate a half, then you see that when I intersect it with the raster representation, I get cell 92, yeah, which is the second. So this is the left, left border and it falls in the second cell. If I do this with a, with a vector representation, um, I get, um, I get, um, oh, that fell out. Well, in any case, then I get these two, 91 and 92, yes. It gets worse when I do this with a, with something that falls on a, on a, on a crossing, yeah, of four cells, then I, I end up in cell 92 because it's the upper left, right, which is part of cell 92. But if I do it in the polygon representation, I get these four. Um, what I will talk about tomorrow a little bit is that uh, if I do the same thing, but I don't use the Euclidean sort of Cartesian flat space, but if I do things on the globe, that actually things look different, yeah? And I see that it's not uploaded correctly yet. Uh, but it looks a little bit different, but I'll get back to that uh, when I discuss uh, tomorrow uh, spherical geometries and uh, operations on the, on the sphere and how that, how that uh, modifies things. Yeah, you can imagine that uh, then a straight line is no longer, sort of horizontal lines no longer follow a constant latitude unless it's the equator yes. because, you know, because of the great circle thing. Um, but with an eye on the clock, uh, I would like to stop and ask if there are any questions right now that you would like to ask. And tomorrow you talk about less of time and the stars. And stars, yeah, yeah, and 80 cubes and so stuff. Be tomorrow, There's a different okay. story tomorrow, yes, it continues. It's a continuation of this. Yes, go ahead. One part that I always get hung up and I uh, always forget how to do it is when you go back to where you create like the geometry, how do they come in as like an SFC object? So how do you get it into a kind of like data frame version where you have um, like next to the geometry column, you have your actual data values? I always have trouble if I created kind of a polygon or a point from scratch. Yeah, that is. The data yeah that is uh that is a good question that is somewhat you know that might be uh, somewhat confusion at the, at the start i didn't address sfc objects at all but i just showed sf objects here uh you know printed but, but there is there is this geometry list column which says i have i'm of type multipolygon but this geometry variable so to speak this column which has you know all kind of it's kind of a ragged array, nested lists with all kinds of rings and thing. Is in the is in the end an SFC object. It's a it's a simple feature geometry list column. Yeah. So so if I take it out, like here, um, then 
I end up with a, what is called a geometry set. Yeah, so this is the, the SFC uh, list column, which is of class SFC and then of subclass SFC underscore multipolygon. Yeah, so it's there always in SF objects. You were asking the other way around. Yeah. If I have an, uh, if I have an, uh, let me take a point, it's easier, right? Uh, if I have a point, uh, I can, the, the class of that is, uh, is one level lower is of, of a simple feature geometry, right? So we have, those are, those are, uh, oops, am I now off video? Let me take you down. So, so these elements, if I take the geometry out of this one, if I take the first one, yeah, then I have a multipolygon, which again is of class uh, SFG, right? So that is a single geometry. So SFCs are lists of geometries, and I can create them with SFC, STSFC, and have a single point, or I can have two points, yeah, or I can have three points, and so on. And then I can create uh, an SF object with STSF, which is essentially calls like data frame, creates this thing, uh, says I have an attribute A is three to one, B is letters, one to three, and a geometry which is called, so I named the geometry, otherwise it gets a very uh, ugly name. If I don't name it uh, in the call, uh, then I get an SF object that has these attributes and combines it with the geometry list column. This is one way. Another way would be to, um, to create a data frame with the two non-geometry things, yeah? And then add the geometry list column with uh, the STSFC list column, right? With this one. Yeah, this is, then I still have a data frame but with the list column, the thing is that data frame, the data frame command doesn't accept list columns, but messes them up, right? So if I say here, geometry is this, then it, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a mess. Oh no, it works. Oh, this is new. Oh, cool. Oh, well. Uh, so this is, this is still a data frame, uh, but I could say SSF, of the data frame and then it looks into, you know, where's my geometry list column and gets, grabs the name of that and warns you if there's more than one and so on and uh, may do some other things. Yeah, so, so this, is the, the cons this is the converter from a data frame. The other one is the constructor the without the S. Is there a reason why it's like a separate list class instead of just being a one column data frame where your column is Well, there's no need to. I mean, a data frame is a, is a data frame is a is a container for columns, and mm -hmm. uh, we only have one column. We only need one column. So if you would make it a data frame, you would add a container, a container around the list. Yeah. You would have a data frame of a list column. Yeah. There's no need for it. A data frame, an SF object is a data frame. Yeah. There, you would add another level of. So there's no need for it. Okay. Good, yeah. Any other questions? So if you have any questions, then, you know, just ask for the next few days. I'll be here around until Thursday, maybe Friday. Um, and uh, thanks for your attention. See you in 20 minutes. See you in 20 minutes, yes. See you in 20 minutes. Shall I leave the Zoom?